So our next session is Finding the Critical Path to Mass Adoption. Um, and I'd like to welcome our moderator, Michael J. Casey of the MIT Media Labs Digital Currency Initiative, and uh, his fellow panelists onto the stage right now. Welcome. Come on in. W welcome to the panelists. Great. Well, thank you very much for coming along. Uh, nice to see that the, the room is still pretty full uh, and that you're all comfortably seated. My name is Michael Casey. Um, uh, I was until very recently uh, a columnist at the Wall Street Journal. Um, I closed the curtain on 18 years of that institution to join MIT's Digital Currency Initiative, uh, which many of you may know about. We're doing all sorts of interesting things to develop research and pilot projects around specific use cases for blockchain technology. Uh, it's an exciting project, check it out. Uh, we have an absolutely fantastic panel here. Uh, let me just introduce them. Um, uh, Connie Chung is from Expedia. As you might know, Expedia has been accepting Bitcoin now for about a year. Yeah, just right? over a year. Okay, John Downing is from Visa Europe and specifically with the Visa Europe CoLab. And Vinnie Lingham from Gift, uh, many of you would I hope have at some stage purchased gift cards via uh, Bitcoin, one of the pioneers in this space. I just want to start out by referencing what it was from a journalist's point of view, as a guy who was kind of coming to awareness around Bitcoin uh, maybe about a year and a half ago, as a way to sort of position where we're at in terms of this notion of consumer adoption. So, you know, pretty early on, for those of us that, that were introduced to it at that stage. It was like, for me, the end of 2013. We all thought of it as a, as a, as a currency, as, as a potential uh, medium of exchange that would challenge the dollar, that would be a more efficient payments network. And, you know, it was an interesting idea. And that was the sort of the narrow frame of my understanding, which sort of maybe suggests the limits of my own mental faculties at the time. And now, of course, you've heard all these conversations about the multiple different applications that could be placed on the blockchain. Uh, but at the time, that's what we were focused on. And so we tended to get very excited about merchant announcements uh, because every time, you know, if there was a Microsoft or an Expedia, or I remember I, I managed to get a little front page pointer about the Sacramento Kings agreeing to take, take Bitcoin. We all thought this was it, the revolution is coming. Um, it turned out not to be quite so, right? So, you know, and, and there's various reasons for that. We'll, we'll discuss it. But the, the idea that A, merchant adoption would be the driver of mainstream adoption, and then also even B, that consumer adoption, for the purposes of a medium exchange at least, would be the driver of mainstream adoption, is now being challenged somewhat. There's an enormous amount of interest in the blockchain and still therefore in Bitcoin, but this consumer story is alive. It's certainly not dead. There's all sorts of ways to think about it, but it's a different story. So that's really just the framework I wanted to give on that. And I think maybe I can just turn to Connie to start with because, you know, you started out, uh, you know, it's a fairly high profile announcement. Yep. Uh, people got very excited about it. What's been the story since then? Yeah, so we launched uh, Bitcoin last June and really the driver, for, uh, I'm our uh, payments product manager and so I look at payment types across the world. So Bitcoin is one of the many that I consider and one of it is just saying, hey, there's customers who are interested in using Bitcoin and I just want to facilitate allowing customers to pay with whatever method they would like. So that's how we ended up launching Bitcoin last year and um, we've seen steady usage of it, um, obviously for all merchants across the board um, because of the value of Bitcoin dropping, you see a decrease, but I don't think that's, it's nothing unique to Expedia. It's across all merchants, I think, with um, how people are saying, hey, you know, I, when Bitcoin value is high, I want to spend that money, and when it's low, I'm going to hold it. So, right, so almost as if they're cashing see. out their, yeah. their gains. It's not yet reaching that medium of exchange position. But there's also the question, you, you didn't introduce incentives of, of any 
sort necessarily. They didn't pass on the savings, the transactional cost savings to the consumer. Right. Um, it's something we can explore. We Right now, we're not doing specific savings for any specific payment type. I don't offer a discount for using your Amex card. There's no special savings for using PayPal. It's another payment type that we just want to facilitate customers to use. Right. Okay. Yeah. But Vinny, just sorry to jump past you, John, and just pick Vinny up on this because you were early on in this space and you did, in fact, mm. try to address that from a discount perspective. Can you tell us your story on that regard? Yeah, so when you look at the, the use cases for Bitcoin, especially in, in the US, I mean, people, everyone has, everyone has credit cards, just generally, uh, versus, relatively speaking, fewer people in the developing world. And so if you don't incentivize the use of Bitcoin, why would people really want to use it to, you know, to make a transaction? Uh, sure, there's some anonymity for certain purchases and types, uh, but there's no real strict use case for it um, as a currency. So what we did was we said, look, realistically, as a merchant, we're saving interchange fees. So we're saving what, at least 1% on, on fees. Why not give it back to the customer? So we have our own rewards program called Gift Points, and we give 2% back on uh, credit cards and PayPal, just as a just general reward for purchasing, and we gave 3% back on Bitcoin. In fact, I think it was 1% on credit cards at the time. We moved credit cards up afterwards. But we, we gave 3% back in Bitcoin. So we passed that saving on to the consumer, and it worked, it worked really well. We looked at, the, obviously, before and after results, um, and it worked really, really well for us. People kept purchasing. People, we had people who were using credit cards to switch to Bitcoin to get extra 1% back. So I think as a merchant, if you're trying to increase Bitcoin adoption, you've got to pass the savings on to the consumer if, if you want them to use Bitcoin. Um, and, and so you obviously had a lot of enthusiasm early on, and that was part of that process. But uh, what's been the story since? I mean, is it, is it been a sustained amount of, of purchasing via Bitcoin, or, or have you seen it also decline? In no. So we, we've actually mean, we've actually retained our customers. So we've you know it's been it's been good that people have used our service, like it. We're, you know we we've grown uh, as a company, uh, but the usage of new Bitcoin users coming in has has slowed. I mean, this is an industry for, uh, industry-wide issue. There's, there's, a, there's probably, the best estimates are there are about two to three million people worldwide using Bitcoin right now. And that number hasn't gone up multiples in the past year. Uh, you know, m maybe in 2013, 2013, 2012, there was probably a 300% increase around about there. But it's actually, shown, it's actually slowed since. And the number of wallets coming up is increasing, but that doesn't mean it's new consumers. It's existing Bitcoin users creating new wallets. So I, I don't quite trust the numbers of new wallets coming out. Right. Uh, the, um, one aspect of it, uh, though, is just this you know, price comparison. I mean, it, it is obviously, there's this, if the savings are not being passed on, and there are other benefits that the consumer is drawing, and, and John, we will get to you, because there's all sorts of ways to move, but I'm just going to shift back to, Johnny, to Connie on this one. Um, you know, we talked about this just, just earlier, uh, going into Expedia, what's the option? Do I use Bitcoin or do I use a, a frequent flyer card that's going to give me you know, frequent flyer points? And, and ultimately, it, it seems like it's a fairly simple equation for the consumer in the developed world to do that. Right, for customers uh, who have that option, who yeah. have a credit card and they get their extra points on there, they can totally choose that. But then we have customers who may not be able to get credit and they can then use Bitcoin or use another form of payment. So, so where are you seeing the growth then? Uh, so basically in the um, developing countries, they're, they don't have... In the Philippines, customers may not be able to get credit, and they're able to, they are now transacting, all their remittances are using uh, Bitcoin that they're passing back and forth. And so now, as those customers are holding Bitcoin, we have the opportunity to get, let these customers buy travel to be able to travel and, and pay for that with Bitcoin in a way they never could with mm -hmm. credit card, right? That's not something that a lot of customers in the Philippines can use. Yeah, I mean, it, it does seem as if uh, the great option for the consumer adoption story here is to seek out those segments of the marketplace domestically and globally where there just isn't an alternative, right? So I, I think the, uh, the initiative between Zappo and Turinga is an a, a appealing one there. This is the, the social, Latin American social media site where all of a sudden you now have the capacity to actually reward people for content creation. There's a, there's a revenue sharing model that you were not able to do as you are here with the YouTube model in Latin America because the financial system didn't support it. Now with Bitcoin, you can. That strikes me as a classic example. But John, you're looking specifically at these kinds of opportunities that exist outside the existing framework. Tell us a little bit about what, first of all, what the CoLab is doing and, and where you're looking in that regard. Sure, thank you. So uh, I guess by way of context, first of all, 
Uh, I work within Visa Europe and I'm part of the new innovation hub called Visa Europe CoLab. Uh, and the reason we've called ourselves CoLab is because we absolutely want to collaborate with all the key parties and all the key players within the, the whole broader payments ecosystem. So this will include some of the startups, it will include some of the established parties, but it'll also include looking at academia, looking at some of the regulatory bodies, uh, some of the compliance elements which are crucial to us. So to really try and seek out the very best ideas and the, the new innovations within the payments domain. And that's why we're so interested in uh, both Bitcoin, uh, the blockchain, and the, all the broader cryptocurrencies, and the real potential for trying to create some transformational change in that space. Now, what we're, what, how we work and operate is that we essentially uh, work with a whole range of different startup organizations. And we identify either proof of concept or proof of technology initiatives run over a relatively short period of time, over approximately 100 days. Uh, and that's to really test and prove different ideas uh, to be able to see rapidly uh, through prototyping, through consumer research, what things could really take hold. So you mentioned around the sort of consumer interest and engagement, uh, and that's a piece which is crucial to us to really get under the covers of what is the real problem we're trying to solve. So yes, we want to understand the technology. Yes, it's uh, crucial, and if you think uh, Visa, probably the first words that people always think when they think of Visa is around uh, trust, reliability, and just the general speed and processing and scale. Uh, just in Europe alone, we, we have the potential of processing in excess of 2,000 transactions a second. Uh, if you start rolling that up to uh, 70, 80,000 transactions a minute, uh, 40 to 60 million transactions a day, you're seeing we're working at huge volumes here. Uh, but what we're doing in uh, CoLab is really trying to experiment and looking at both some of the evolutionary technologies, so things which is just the next stage on from maybe contactless or... Uh, some of the wearable technologies which we see how things are moving forwards, or really some of the revolutionary space as well. Uh, and so we're really trying to sort of, uh, project ourselves forward, and a couple of the speakers earlier today talked about looking one year, two years, three years ahead, and trying to really understand how that market may be shaping and changing. Uh, and I totally agree with Connie that some of the real opportunities we're going to be in some of the developing markets uh, and trying to create and enable uh, uh, solutions, payment solutions for those people which don't really uh, exist today or not economically viable. And so we're, we're exploring that amongst some of our different uh, proof of concept areas. But uh, I, I guess it, if I may, that um, yeah, we're, we're kind of thinking in sort of four or five broad areas at this point in time, just to give you a flavor. So you know, the first three would certainly be around micropayments, uh, macro payments, and international payments. Uh, and we've heard a little bit of discussion uh, in one of the, the first group debates about are we really ready for the potential of micropayments yet? And I found that very interesting to listen to, that you've really got to understand what is the, uh, the true business opportunity before all this investment gets put in, because people are only going to go so far with just thinking this is a cool idea. Uh, macro payments have always been a real challenge, very complex, uh, very time-consuming to move money across different markets or borders with all the, tr the right regulatory focus as well. Um, and, and for international payments, just individuals who want to send money to their families or uh, you know, to, to, to purchase goods and services, we want to make those things easier, but still with the same level of accountability, trust, and reliability. Uh, but we're also actively exploring the, the potential of smart contracts uh, and, and how we could potentially uh, really take advantage of the, uh, the capabilities around the private blockchain. Uh, and those are things where we genuinely know we don't have all the answers, and we're, we're very open and, and clear about that, which is why we've created this innovation hub, which creates a, a real community environment of going to find the very best people or the leading academics. So we've, we've collaborated with uh, Garrick previously, he helped uh, work with us on an event to really stimulate some of the thinking uh, across a number of the uh, uh, organizations in Europe to, to try and project forward and say, what, what would we see as success in two or three years? What is it that the, 
uh, the consumers, the merchants, the potentially the banks, and all the organisations we work with, what would they? What are some of those future problems they need to solve? Now, I'm going to have to ask you this question because I know that it's probably going through the minds of a number of people in this room. I don't know how much you can tell us, but obviously the name Visa in front of uh, this collab begs the question: you know, it, it, what sort of uh, study is being done for the application of blockchain to you know, the infrastructure of the credit card credit card networks? So I, I think it's a great question, and the the the, the fact is that, that one, or, one or two of our proof of concepts will be examining, exploring exactly those questions. So we are relatively early days in that domain. And as we run through some of our either proof of technology uh, work activities, and we've, we've already started collaborations with partners, some of whom will be in the audience today. And as we're ready to communicate some of the outputs of those activities, we'll absolutely share it with this audience and beyond. Uh, but we. We know at this point we have a very stable, a very robust uh, uh, payments uh, environment processing huge volumes of transactions, as I said earlier. Uh, and we absolutely don't want to tamper or change with any of those pieces, but more see some of the areas where it hasn't been historically designed to work around some of the, the, the payment uh, examples we've already mentioned, and to see how the blockchain could really uh, solve some of those problems in right. the future. So we're going to run the test. We're going to, you know, sort of in, in true uh, sort of analytical style, not try and prejudge the answers and say this is what we know is going to happen until we've got the evidence either from the reliability of the technologies or the, the feedback from the consumers, merchants, depending on the different activities we're undertaking. Now, Vinny, that's a good segue to you to talk, if you don't mind, a little bit about the uh, prepaid card management program that you have on the blockchain. I think one of the interesting ways to thematically think about this is that even though we're talking about this, this panel is about merchant adoption, about consumer adoption. It's a different, it's a different focus here. We're talking about the infrastructure, the, the protocol, the, the, the actual management of the underlying system. What's GIFT doing? And also, because obviously First Data being a payment processor, your, your, your parent company, uh, very much involved in, in the traditional credit card business. Um, what, tell us a little bit about the, the, the prepaid blockchain management sure. system. So we, we looked at obviously other use cases for the blockchain. I mean. You know, personally, I, I think that Bitcoin as a currency is, is a, it's a medium of exchange right now, you know, especially for, for uh, foreign remittances. You, know, you buy Bitcoin, you don't hold it. It's, it's, it's similar to gold where you know, I'm not going to pay you five ounces of gold in six months' time. We, don't, you know, we, we can't set a price based on that. Uh, so Bitcoin is used kind of for inter, intraday trading or, or remittances. And so um, you know, when we look at what, what else can we use the blockchain for as a, as a, as a store of, of data, uh, we worked with Chain.com and we actually came up with a concept around uh, taking gift card data. So, so it, it, a gift card is really a, a string of numbers, uh, so it's typically 16 digits, which has a balance, and then transactions that go against that balance. So uh, it's a ledger, if, if you will. Um, you go, into a, uh, you go into a Starbucks, you give Starbucks 100 bucks, they give you a gift card, which means they owe you 100 bucks worth of um, coffees. And every time you go in for a coffee for two, two bucks, 250, it comes off the ledger, right? So, and then eventually you whittle down to zero. And it's, uh, it's typically, you can't have reloadables, but they're typically a single balance cards. And so what happens with, um, with the, in the digital, in, in, the, in the plastic gift card world, when I give you a plastic gift card, that, that physical gift card changes hands. Um, yeah, and, and, there's, and you can sell the card, right? But the reality is that number stays the same. And so anyone who has access to that number on the card can actually use those funds. So it's not a very secure way of, of transferring stored value. And in the digital world, the same thing. If you have a, a digital, an e-gift card, and you forward it to someone, or, or you try and sell it to move it around, uh, the balance stays on that number. So in theory, you could sell these cards. And, and there are secondary marketplaces where you sell these cards. So it's not very secure. And so we looked at using the blockchain to actually take um, the, store the number or store the value in a in a bitcoin in a, a you know a basic take like a satoshi and store it in there and use that the bitcoin to to uh, as a, as, a, as a ledger of record and anyone who has um, our wallet application or eventually anyone else's wallet application whoever's holding that digital card can move those funds around um, but the number keeps changing based upon the, the data in the blockchain. And by doing it that way, we can secure, we can secure the, the gift card. So if we think about it, um, it's, it's effectively like two-factor authentication where that number keeps changing. So no one can ever, no one can ever hold the, 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 the gift card data for more than 30 seconds 
in theory. And that's what we're basically trying to do right now. We're trying to move, we're trying to atomize the, the gift card information and move it to the blockchain so it's transferable. Okay. I mean, I'll take some questions and I'm going to pull out this uh, Ubuit uh, iPad app we have here. And the first question is from Anonymous. I think that's not, you know, the group Anonymous. That's actually somebody who's decided not to give their name, <laughs> uh, just in case you're wondering. Um, and the question is, why would I want to use BTC to pay for goods when I live in a country with a stable fiat currency? What I'm going to do is flip that on its head, though. Um, and I think to say is, you know, how important is managing the volatility of Bitcoin and let's assume that we might one day get to the point where it's less volatile, uh, to adoption. Connie, have you seen that as a factor in people's willingness to use it at Expedia? Um, I mean, we, I think we saw a general decline as the currency value declines. Um, and it, it's no indication to us that we should you know, not offer that at all. There's still people who are regularly transacting with Bitcoin on our site. Mm -hmm. um, and there are people transacting with it in countries that have very stable currencies. You know, we have people regularly from Europe still transacting um, and America still transacting with Bitcoin. So I think, you know, there are certain, there is a market of people who still find that valuable. And even at the lower uh, value of Bitcoin, they're still choosing that. So, But, but the pattern that, that attaches activity to the price of bitcoins tells me that it's a speculative instrument rather than a, a currency, right? Because because ultimately, you know, there are people who are just, you know, it seems cashing out their gains. It doesn't mean that it's not an effective medium of exchange in that regard, but it's not reaching that that point. Um, do, you, do you think that, uh, I mean, and, and looking also, I think, at the developing world where perhaps that stability question is a relative one. Mm -hmm. uh, do you find that in, in, in countries where you've got that volatility, you know, Bitcoin actually looks more attractive and you're seeing more? Yeah, use? I definitely think that's the untapped market for, um, for Bitcoin. You know, there's it's also for Expedia, right? We have customers, it's, we're a very global company. We have customers all over the place that don't have the same infrastructure and stability we have in our currency in the US and in Europe. And um, that becomes the customer base that we want to enable to to travel and you know whatever else they're trying to buy with Bitcoin, we we want to maintain offering that as an option for them. Okay, actually, I'll, I'll take a different angle on this. Um, so I, I'm I'm originally from South Africa. And we effectively either don't have access to credit, or if they have access to credit, which means they're affluent, their credit card is just not accepted in, in the U.S. This is the perfect use case of Bitcoin because if they buy Bitcoin, you will you know anyone would ship the goods to them if they're paying. It's effectively paying with digital cash, and that for me is a very strong use case for Bitcoin. Um, if you think about it, the U.S. is what, we're 300 million people. There's seven billion people in the world. So if you're worried about international shipping and 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 the risk of doing so, accepting Bitcoin allows you to do that. But you know, again, Bitcoin usage as a currency in the U.S. is very limited. In my and the cashing out of gains uh, it happens here because a lot of people bought the coins. They went up in price. They they spend them here. But what's happening in other parts of the world? The people are actually buying coins for intraday use. So they'll buy the coins on the spot and use them within a few minutes to make a purchase internationally. Mm -hmm. okay. I think it, it, it kind of always, it always comes back to the consumer or business need as well and what we're, what we're seeing here. And I think it gets to the heart of that question of if there is a, a perfectly easy and reliable way of um, uh, being able to purchase goods, which we know there is today, you know, you know, notwithstanding uh, some of the examples you've had that you know, most people could get their uh, visa card out and they will be totally confident that they can make their payments and it will run through. And they could choose to do that with their card. They can choose to use that with their new sort of uh, Apple Pay uh, capabilities or their uh, Apple Watch or, or any of the new technologies which are coming on the horizon. And it's all about giving consumers choice mm -hmm. and, and flexibility to, on different situations. I think the volatility is a key challenge at the moment. The, you know, I, I hold... Uh, Bitcoins in two or three different wallets. I have a Bitcoin uh, sort of denominated uh, Visa card. Obviously, its, it's primary currency is uh, UK sterling, but it's one that is funded through Bitcoin. But uh, in truth, that is kind of, it wouldn't be my first Visa card I'd pull out of my wallet. I would use mm. it for particular situations. And I'm doing it partly for testing at the moment, but partly to see if that has the potential for wider usage and adoption in the future. Mm -hmm. So I think it's, it's somewhat, some of these areas is about creating choice of people uh, and ensure and different people have different circumstances. We just heard a, an example here uh, and, and Connie's given a couple of examples where actually using Bitcoin is far preferable or, or the, the person's choice versus any other 
uh, you know, traditional fiat currency. Mm -hmm. or, or no option. Like, or I mean, no you, you literally, right. it, 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 there is no global payment rails. There's no uh, one, you know, you look at Visa, MasterCard, Amex, Discover, all, all these platforms out there, they're very uh, country by country specific. So when you look at cross-border international trade, there is no one global uh, platform that, that safely, that's safe for basically the, the seller. Okay, because that's really the issue here. If you're a retailer online, you're selling and shipping goods to another country, you're at risk. With a credit card, you're at risk. And that's the bottom line. And so with Bitcoin, you're, you're not at risk to ship internationally. Um, and I think that, that for me is the strongest use case. But that, again, excludes the US right now. From yeah. There's another question here from Fernando. Uh, is mass adoption down to more merchants accepting or more people holding Bitcoin? Is it just a chicken or egg problem? And again, I just might put a little slightly different spin on that. I mean, is there a, is there a way in which some you know, uh, critical mass is developed from some other source, whether it's the Internet of Things or some you know, big company that decides to adopt it or a government that uses it for procurement? How do you deal with that chicken and egg problem is basically the issue here. So maybe I, I could take that because I think it is, it's one of the classic areas where Visa adds value in that domain. So contactless uh, technology has been around for many years. Uh, but clearly, for it to be to reach mass adoption, it needed uh, the uh, merchants to be able to, to accept uh, contactless cards, and of course, it needed consumers to have cards issued by their banks. Now, not only that, you actually needed to change some of the, the mindsets and behaviours of people, because certainly as I was growing up, there was this almost golden rule that thou shalt not use my credit card for less than ten pounds. It was frowned upon by merchants and to get your card out to buy a newspaper or a coffee would be that they'd, they'd put, ask you to put it back again. Mm -hmm. So it was this combination of uh, encouraging and stimulating an environment for merchants to, to upgrade their uh, point of sale terminal network, for the banks to, to start pushing uh, and, and enabling more people to, to have contactless uh, uh, credit and debit cards, but also to then create some environments where it's actually preferential and beneficial to people and they knew that if they went in to buy their coffee at Starbucks that they may, that it would certainly be accepted but it may also be actively encouraged. Um, we've seen in the, the UK alone that just the, the adoption through the, uh, the, the London Transport Network has sent the contactless usage through the roof mm. uh, in London even compared to other cities in the UK. And so it's, it's finding those cases where for people to be able to, to use that technology on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, to know it's going to work reliably, uh, and it is a benefit to those different parties. So it's certainly beneficial for me to buy uh, my coffee if I can do it more quickly, or to use my credit or debit card to go through the underground because I just have to tap it. I don't need a separate Oyster card these days, uh, you know, the payment card for getting across the London transport system. The, those things are real benefits. Uh, not only to the consumers, but to the, the organizations as but well. But it also speaks to the idea that there are plenty of ways, <coughs> it seems, to deliver that value to the consumers, to deliver the convenience of it without Bitcoin. Uh, though, <coughs> I, I guess the point, and apologies, the point I was trying to so illustrate there is that it, it took quite some considerable effort, and Visa invested a lot of um, time and capital and energy in trying to stimulate that domain, and, and Basin still continues to do so, of recognizing that these technologies are great. I'm talking about contactless for the minute, uh, but you need to have that whole community to be able to use it actively. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, there, there's a dynamic there which would be similar for Bitcoin to, to enable that mass adoption through merchants for consumers to know that that's their uh, uh, you know, currency of choice or payment mechanism of choice. There needs to be something which creates that it's better than doing whatever mm -hmm. I'm doing today. Because if I owed Connie some money, she'd probably say, well, take, give me £10 and I'll be happy with that first of all, or, or $10. Um, if there was something which was just as easy, which created value, you know, sending uh, uh, you know, sort of a £10 equivalent through my uh, Bitcoin wallet, wallet to Connie, she may say, actually, that's preferable uh, because then I can choose to, to switch that into any currency right. I want. And that is then a benefit uh, to both parties. We know that happens very quickly. We know it's irrefutable, all the things that have been spoken about already today. And so it's, 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 it's almost turning it around and looking at that problem it's trying to solve. And I think that is one of the, uh, the keys to the mass adoption. And I know it's one of the, the speakers earlier said they didn't like that term killer apps. And I'm, I kind of agree uh, in, in some respects, but also I think that there will be, there will be something which 
maybe one year or two years or three years from now, we're all using as, as common a language as we use Facebook and Google today, which has created that mass adoption capability. Mm -hmm. um, I think companies will start looking more and more actively about developing a broader blockchain strategy once they realize that the real potential uh, the, that those technologies and capabilities create in the same way that 20 years ago companies were originally saying, do we need to worry about the internet? To companies who changed the whole dynamic and space, right. uh, created new marketplaces and communities through it. Okay, I don't know if we have any more time. June, do we? Do, we'll have to wrap it up. Okay, thank you very much for your time. Give me the kill switch sign. <laughs> uh, <laughs>